it's Tuesday afternoon, it's 4 p.m. in Central Europe and it's Space Cafe Web Talk time. Our Space Cafe Web Talk 33 minutes with Jennifer Menner will begin very soon. Thank you for joining us for our talk today about the critical role of satellite networks in 5G and beyond ecosystems. As always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. Space Watch Global is a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keeping our independent journalism active. We really appreciate that. And I know many of you already are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. And the latest one featured Bülent Altern, a SpaceX veteran and Mineric CEO. We also have new exciting episodes in the Space Cafe radio with Walt Everett of Iridium and Elodie Bio from ESA. And more to come. Our backlog is still piling up. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively and become a Space Watcher and get hold of these cool Space Watcher t-shirts. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our web page in the events section and on YouTube. So, driven out of curiosity, one weekend I went to my favorite online shopping place and I came across the Spectrum Wars book. Started reading the policy and technology debate discusses the evolution evolution of spectrum use and management caused by the rise of 5G and beyond in all wireless technologies from terrestrial wireless, including mobile and fixed to non-terrestrial, including satellites and drone technologies. That catched my interest. So that sounds so interesting that invited the author to our Space Cafe today. And here she is, Jennifer Manner. A very warm welcome and thanks for joining our Space Cafe today. So, for all of you that does not know uh, Jennifer, she is in her real uh, job, the Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs as Ecostar Corp at the Ecostar Corporation, a uh, huge uh, use network systems, where she is responsible for the company's domestic and international regulatory and policy issues, including spectrum management, new technologies and market access. She has held senior positions in the US government, including deputy chief of the office and, and engineering and uh, of engineering technology. And before um, that our deputy chief of the FCC's public safety and homeland security bureau, as well as senior counsel to FCC's commissioner and a range of US tele telecommunication companies and is a widely published on telecommunication issues. Jennifer is also an award-winning documentary film producer. Her latest film, When Wire Was King, The Transformation of Telecommunication is scheduled to be released in 2020, 20, so 2022. 20, so now we have it. So this year, in other words, so welcome Jennifer to our Space Cafe again. Let's talk about the film, first of all. A warm, uh, an award-winning filmmaker. Sounds amazing. So we have an award-winning film producer, filmmaker in our team as well, with Markus, Markus Moslechner. He's the host of our Space Cafe podcast series. So tell us more about your documentary and how you went into the glorious film sector. So, I mean, I see Hollywood all over the place. So, um, well, thank you so much for having me today. I I'm thrilled to be here. And um, my film career started um, actually with a dinner at a wedding with um, a, a senior member of, of um, telecommunications industry who was telling me his history in telecom. And I said, you know, there's so many great stories about how we ended up in this wonderful world. If you think about when I joined telecommunication in the early 90s, um, we didn't have any, you know, we, we barely had, um, you know, NGSOs were just starting. Um, we still had monopoly phone companies around the world and so forth. And I wanted to capture this. So I actually started um, by start trying to write a book 
um, which was, um, it turns out I'm not William Kennedy and I can't write an oral history. Um, so I realized I had to try and do a film and I didn't want to start with this film. So I started my husband as a scientist and he works on a model organism called zebrafish. So I did a film about zebrafish, which are just an incredible scientific model. And that film can be found at www.zebrafishfilm.org. And I can put that in the chat in a little bit. Um, it's a short documentary about the, the wonders of zebrafish and how they're a great biomedical research tool. Um, that movie ended up being um, quite celebrated. I was surprised. And we ended up as a finalist at the Cannes Film Festival. Wow. And, and uh, it was just a couple of years ago before the pandemic. And so that was quite an experience. And we, we took a number of prizes home from other film festivals. And, and that really set me up with the confidence to do this film. This is a full length documentary and it really traces and it is a little bit US focused because every country was so different. Um, I am American, so that's what I know best. Um, and we've really focused on the creation of competition and how we went from a very strong monopoly market with AT&T and it focuses quite heavily on a period in the seventies and what I found most interesting for this audience was something I didn't realize. True competition started um, under the Nixon White House, but because there was a desire to have an increase in the number of voices in the news media. And so it actually started in the domestic satellite industry. Um, they were about to give ComSat, which was majority owned by AT&T, the sole monopoly for domestic satellite communications and they thought that would be a bad idea because then AT&T would control all, all the mechanisms for, mm -hmm. for news. And so they chose to create a competitive satellite network, which led to actually a really burgeoning of the cable TV industry um, and, and ultimately um, set a really important precedent for, for liberalizing telecommunications generally in the United States. And I, I think globally in that regard and that it really influenced. So it's an exciting movie. It captures a lot of people um, who have been working in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, 80s. So I'm, I'm glad to have them on film and hear their stories. Um, and has some great visionaries like Vince Cerf in it um, who share some of their views about the future. And of course, because I am a space watcher um, to, to steal from you guys, um, you know, it does focus a lot on space as well, because I think that's so important. And I, I think as we'll talk about today, really what's going on in space with 5G and, and soon 6G is so incredible. I really think it is going to change the landscape. So thank you so much again for having me. No, oh, it's, it's our pleasure. Before we jump into this topic today, I'm, I would say I need your help. And I'm honest, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated about spectrum and I know how important it is. Sometimes I think it's 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 over my horizon. So I I simply can't follow the discussion. I can't follow the ITU, the WRC things, and and how this mechanism is. So maybe you can enlighten us. Can you give us a really a brief over uh, overview? And I know it, it's it's an that's a huge task. So what is five G? What is three G PP? Um and in and for or in space. So, I mean, 5G, many of us have on our mobile, uh, but that's terrestrial. But how does that relate to space? So, I, I think we're in this incredibly exciting period. When we think about previous generations of, of wireless services, we think about uh, 1G, I don't think even exists, 2G barely exists, but we think about 3G. Um, and that was all mobile telephony, you know, cellular um, phones. Then you get to 4G, and it still is. And what started changing was the recognition that we really care about the user experience. And so at the end of the day, you, Torsen, as a, as, a, as a user, don't really care how you get your communications. You want good, reliable communications, whether it's, you know, watching your webcast, um, podcasts, whether it's, you know, streaming videos, whether it's playing video games, doing programs, whatever. And the recognition, which really has just, you know, appeared in the past couple of years was you can't do that with a single technology. There were some pushes on this and you've got to have some sort of standard based 
approach for all the technologies. So 3GPP, um, like its name, was actually created around the 3G time to create global standards for 3G so that the networks around the world would all be able to interoperate, interconnect, whatever word you want to use. And the satellite industry spent the last, probably since before the pandemic, um, really working together in 3GPP to try and become a part of the standards process that was going on in 3GPP. And that's not so spectrum-based as the ITU, but the standards do cover certain frequency bands. So, so that is important. And what was so exciting, finally in March of this year, 3GPP released its end-to-end hyphen NR standard, which is non-terrestrial network standard, which included satellite. It also includes high altitude platforms, drones, those sorts of things. We care most about it from a, a satellite spectrum. And I, I think that's where the most excitement is right now. Um, doesn't mean other technologies won't come along. Um, and so that set the framework for the first time that really you're gonna you're creating this network of network and it doesn't matter what it is. Um, similarly at the ITU, the ITU has a function of, of putting guideposts, what we call identifying spectrum for something called IMT, International Mobile Telephony, and, and the 5G version is IMT-2020. Today there's spectrum identified in the table of allocations, which is where all the frequency assignments are um, for, for terrestrial IMT 2020. And we're working right now in one of the working parties um, on creating a satellite component of IMT 2020 um, to match what's going on in 3GPP because a lot of developing countries in particular, or other countries will look at that table of frequency allocations and say, what band should I make available? Mm -hmm. And if it's identified under the, under the radio regulations, they'll say, oh, this is a really good band to have IMT 2020 or 5G for satellite or terrestrial or whatever. So it's a really important part of it. What's been really interesting, Torsen, is um, the equipment vendors have been very supportive of this effort. And maybe a little, not at first, it was kind of like it took a process, but I think the vendors are starting to recognize this is important. And now 3GPP has done the standard. So you're gonna start seeing satellite bands in the chipsets which is super exciting because that means it'll be standard in a chipset, gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, but where we are seeing is some of the operators are being hostile. And, and my personal view is that that's probably anti-competitive, that really now that we're part of that ecosystem, we are a competitive, you know, for years, you know, you thought maybe Iridium is or Global Star, you can name your operator. But, but I don't think it was as real a threat. And now that we're part of the 3GPP standard, starting to become part of the ITU standards in, in more of an integrated way, I, I think that is a threat where the vendors see it more as a business opportunity. Okay. I, I do think we will come to that um, later because I'm, I'm very interested to, to understand what you mean with the anti-competitiveness, um, we, but we come there. Um, you just came back home from from Kigali in, in, in Rwanda. That's where we had our, our pre-talk. And I had to look it up. That was the ITU WTDC. Okay. It is the World Telecommunication Development Conference. That can be so easy. So even you have this massive uh, abbreviation. So what happens there and why is it so important for us in the space sector? I think it's becoming increasingly important. So, so WTDC is, is um, just to back up for folks who aren't as familiar, the ITU has three sectors, radio communications, which is where we talk about spectrum, telecommunications, which is more standard oriented, and then development. And the development sector, which is what WTDC was under in the leadership of uh, Doreen Bogdan, um, who's a fantastic director of the development sector, um, and did a great job at WTDC, is where we really look to work with developing countries to educate them about technologies and services. And so an important part of traditionally WTDCs, they occur about every four years, just like WORCs. Um, and like WRCs, they're not treaty, they're not creating treaty text, but they're still creating what the work plan is for the next three to four years for the, for the development sector. 
and we decide on the important issues that we're going to look at. And one of the most important issues, which is where satellite plays such an important part, is bridging the digital divide. Um, and there was a couple of things that were super unique about this meeting that I really, I really praise um, during Bogdan for. One was she started before the conference started a youth summit because she really foresees that youth are going to be critical to ensuring that we solve this digital divide issue. And the next piece was the partnership to connect. And we've never done anything like this ITU. And I thought it was, you know, at first I was somewhat skeptical and, and um, a number of companies and countries have committed over $364 million to help solve the digital divide. So for instance, my company committed deploying two and a half million dollars in community Wi-Fi sites um, that are using satellite throughout Latin America. And that will connect hundreds of thousands of additional people. Um, we also committed an advocacy piece where we're going to work with governments to teach them about better ways to do licensing of satellite earth stations or other things, universal service funding to make it more technology neutral. A lot of countries, including my own, have a bias against satellite, which I think doesn't make sense economically, but that's a story for another day. But, but countries have come out and said, we're going to do X, other companies are doing Y. So that was really important. And then we have the, the conference, which is still going on, which is really focused at the study questions. And they're looking at things, how do we, how do we connect people? How do we help during you know, emergency response and disaster recovery and those sorts of things? So it's a unique opportunity to help the developing world get connected and get connected in an intelligent way. So, so there are a number of um, satellite operators and, and groups, just so uh, the Global Satellite Organization was very active there um, and actually signed an MOU with Rwanda to try and advance space. So, so there was a lot going on there. It was a very exciting conference. So thank you for the question. And. Um... Rwanda is, is on, on its way to become the most prominent superpower in space. I mean, at least uh, when we count there, uh, the number of filed satellite, which goes, I think, up to 330,000, what they, what they brought to, to our ITU. How serious is that as a, as a side question? So, and I think if you counted the number of satellite filings through countries like Germany, Netherlands, and UK, you would end up with a higher number if that's just one system in Rwanda. So that's eSpaces system. Um, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk to um, Greg Weiler, who's the head of eSpace. So I don't, I, I, I believe he is serious and he has other successful projects, OneWeb and O3B. Um, you know, I, I think the bigger cons the bigger question is how do we start to handle this? And this is going to be a question at the yeah. WRC. And, and I think in other groups, you know, whether it's UN COP US or other groups, is how do you handle spectrum management when you're talking about these absolutely unthinkable mm -hmm. um, size constellations and, and space is not infinite. We all know that, right? And then how do you handle the space traffic management? You know, because you have different layers, and I think of it in terms of a 3D management process, both for spectrum and for space traffic, and, and how do you do this? So I, I think it creates real challenges. I, I think the good news on Rwanda is they are a good, they, they have a good regulatory process. They're very open to talking, and I think the MOU that was signed between JASOA mm -hmm. and Rwanda you know, is an important part of that and, and shows that they want to they want to work with the industry and they want to be a good steward. So I'm hopeful. Good. Let's talk about more the practical things than, and the, the today things. So what is the evolution you see today uh, from 5G to 6G and what what does 6G will bring us? Uh, is it just typical faster, better, cheaper, or is there really something behind? So this was probably the most difficult thing I had to deal with in my book, um, Spectrum Wars, was that transition to 6G, because I thought I knew it all, right? So, and I started to do some research um, and I kind of am a little scared um, because when you really look at 6G, and I'm not sure it'll 
you know, 5G isn't really what 5G was said to be. So whether 6G really can do this or you need another generation, maybe it's 7G. But the idea that you're moving from kind of a, an internet of things to an internet of senses. So when you think of 5G, it's connecting everyone and everything. When you move to 6G, um, the, the technologists are really looking at it as, how do I sense things? Um, and so that requires not just knowing, um, not just connecting things, but, but people, but picking up environmental, they, everything just being sensing. Um, and I kind of think back, reminds me of a, a very old movie with James Coburn called The President's Analyst, um, which was a movie where they put they were, the phone company, this was back in the 60s, so it was supposed to be at and I assume, was putting a chipset in everyone's head. And, and if you look at Elon Musk, right, is developing a, a neurochipset. He's, he's announced that he has a team working on it. So are you really going to connect people? I hope not. Um, but, you know, maybe you do, but, but just the ability to sense things and know what's going on and, you know, really have a more interactive experience is what's coming. And that's where space comes into play, where you're, you're not, if you have to connect everything all the time and, and sense things. And I think that's why you're starting to look at things like the much higher frequency bands, the terahertz bands, because all of a sudden you have a different environment. And that's where I really think you start to, to see this 3D approach terrestrially and in space where you're just gonna have to have a whole much more communications. I personally think, can that be done in 2030? Yeah, you know, maybe, but um, you know, it's, it's gonna take some time and you're really not gonna see, see this coming, start to really come until another 10 years from now is, is my guess. It, it's, it's a pretty big step forward. I'm always scared when, when someone talks about chipsets in, in brains or yeah. we're just watching on one of our favorite our streaming platform, Severance, uh, which is picking that up. So splitting these is a brain and a work brain and then private brain. So and they're not interconnected. It's, it's super scary. And you need a break from one episode to the next one. However, coming back to the 5G topic, what is where we live with, it seems that there are still severe challenges and hurdles. What can you can you see? What can you tell us about that? So I do think there's a number of hurdles, um, not just for space, but for terrestrial, but, but I'll focus on space first. Um, first, there has to be a change in mindset in the satellite industry. Um, traditionally, a lot of the operators have used proprietary technologies and we're moving to a much more standards-based approach. Um, so you're gonna start to see an evolution and, and I think it's a forced evolution and it will come where it's gonna become, standards are gonna become increasingly important and that will become even more so as we get to 6G. You know, so 3GPP finished release 17, they're now on release 18. That's getting kind of further into the weeds the desire to go to the ITU to create the IMT 2020 standard for satellite there, I expect in the next year or two, we'll see the movement towards including satellite in the IMT 2030, which is the 6G standards. So, so that's a big thing, but then also getting operators to work together. There's, there's, you know, this is where I go back to kind of, is there an anti-competitive basis bias? You know, as I said, I think the user doesn't really care what they use, they care that they have the service they want. And, and that's going to push folks to work together. And, and I do really think that's part of what drove the 3G, besides for, I think, great work on the, on behalf of the satellite industry, both JASOA and there's a satellite interest group that's led by ESA really, really put a lot of, you know, elbow grease into this. But, but I think at the end of the day, elbow grease doesn't do it. It's economics that does it. And I think there will be an economic driver to further include, you know, for things, everything from backhaul for cellular to use satellites to, to I think there's a real market and direct to cell phone for satellites. If you're, you know, if you're a consumer and you're out in the mountains and you want to send a, a picture to someone, could you use your cell phone that has a satellite chipset and, you know, knows to travel over that link where there's nothing else? 
you know, public safety, of course, military, um, you know, broadband, there's still going to be a number of people who are unconnected. You know, I think Starlink, um, you know, Hughes has, has had a fantastic use and bias that have had terrific broadband businesses. I think the NGSOs like Starlink, and you can pick your favorite one, tell us that, mm -hmm. um, whoever you want, um, are all going to bring a, a new dimension to that. Um, so, so I see it all coming together and combining, and it's also going to force satellite operators to work together to bring together different services where their strengths are as well. You mentioned this, or, or um, the term anti-competitiveness, or again, what, what does it mean, and and how can we overcome that? Or um, if that's an maybe a naive question. So I I wish I exactly knew how to answer that because of course overcoming anti and as I said I think the only way that it comes is when consumers demand certain services and I think as consumers demand increased connectivity it's going to force terrestrial operators to work together I, I don't think it's I, you know if all of a sudden I can offer a great um, I'm just going to focus on this a a, a great service where. And maybe it's a little bit money, you know, not everyone's going to want it, but maybe I have an app on my phone where if I'm out of the range of the, of the cell phone provider I'm providing, I can switch over to satellite for whatever cost, then that becomes something that that's wanted. Right. And, and I do think you can see where this has happened. You know, Facebook worked very hard with the satellite operators to provide greater connectivity around the globe. They had been a, a big believer in community Wi-Fi um, and worked with us and Biosat and other operators to bring that. So I think as people start to recognize that it's complementary and not necessarily competitive, you're really not looking at the same markets. But, I think but, maybe that'll help do it. But didn't we had last year, I think there was a rumor or for the Apple iPhone yeah. 13 that they will be connected or the possibility to connect it to satellite networks. Right. Is that reality? Is that something yeah. what is feasible or is that pushed back now a few generations? So I can't speak, I, Apple's been very quiet about that. So I have yeah. you know, inside information, but, but I have read about that, of course. And I think it's very feasible. Um, there's no reason, um, especially, and I've been working on um, the concept of a, a small device being able to use satellite for years. I was involved with what we call MSS, ATC, or CGC in Europe, still am. Um, but I really believe as we get to this next generation um, using 3GPP with the chipsets, you're going to have the chipset included. The antennas are so much better now, and the cost efficiencies are. I started working in this field in the 90s representing a company, Teledesic, who was bringing the first NGSO high speed data we didn't even have the term broadband but the costs weren't there it's not that the technology wasn't there it was just too expensive and, and same here i've been working on this project since the early 2000s with mss atc and what i think you're seeing now is you're for the first time you're really seeing um the cost because of the standards changing that you're going to be able to get this in the phone without paying extra prices and so forth. You still have to get consumers to want it as a service. That's a different story, right? And everyone cares deeply. We all complain when we get our cell phone bills. My bill's too high, right? So do you course. want to pay another dollar or two or three or whatever? That's a different story. But but the technology is there, and I think the cost structure is there. And you're seeing that today, you know, with with the NGSOs who are starting to deploy for broadband. It is a it is a cost effective solution for the first you know really that you can compete. I see. Um, a few weeks back, we had the oh, I had the chance to speak with Adnan Al Moheri, the CTO of of Yasat and mm -hmm. Soraya, about their Soraya's of, of next generation or satellite. What is mainly an L band mm -hmm. geo satellite? And we spoke as well. And of course. And he got the same question. How do you envision the future of satellite networks or satellite communication? Is it MSS? Is it Geo? Is it Mio? Is it purely Leo or what a few will make us believe? Or is it a blended mix of everything? So how do you envision the next decade? 
I think it's a hybrid solution, a, a mixed solution. And, and we had talked about this a little in our prep call. Um, you know, you're, you still need um, certain, certain attributes of different networks. And geos still provide very good, low cost, high capacity services. Leos, of course, have low latency. You know, MEOs have different characteristics. And I think ultimately what you're going to see is there'll be certain, you, you might end up with a hybrid system where we're deploying right now, my company, a hybrid terrestrial and satellite service where you could use LTE for low latency and you'll be able to use the satellite for high capacity in areas where you don't have a lot of coverage. Um, but, but talking further, you could end up in a situation where you provide a user both a hybrid, a hybrid terminal that's both Leo and Geo. Maybe they need a certain amount of high capacity service and they need to connect widely distributed networks. And then they have the Leo for the low latency and there's a different cost structure. At the end of the day, I don't think it will matter to the user because you're gonna have one operator who's saying, here, I can meet your goals. What are your goals and I'll put together. And we do that today with a combination. Um, my company's a big system integrator. Well, look, and maybe it's fiber, maybe it's cellular, maybe it's fixed wireless, maybe it's satellite, maybe it's high altitude platforms. And you're, and that's where the standards bodies are so important because you need this all to work together. I, I hear you. And uh, I think I could relay, uh, relay a lot of what you said to the American market. It, it might work there perfectly from the hybrid uh, approach or um, here in Europe, very fragmented market, or as you know, with or uh, um, with, with local um, or national uh, telecom providers. How can this future look for me? Then, as Torsten, so um, I mean, you talked about the fusion of networks. So, can I then select my satellite network on my mobile in the next years, and then, of course, getting charged moon prices? I, I actually think it's going to be a little different. And, and I don't think the fragmentation, I think the MVNOs and the operators are going to look for partners. Um, okay. and, and whether it's a national net or it'll be over applications. You, you'll be able to switch, you'll be able to choose an app. So, so my, I think the ideal vision would be you have a single provider and the single provider works out so it can meet your needs towards, you know, it's kind of like personalized medicine, right? a personalized communication service. Torsen wants low latency. He wants to be able to reach in anywhere, but he really likes to stream videos. So he needs high capacity, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer has different needs. So it could work like that, but it may take a few years. And so at first it may be done over applications and maybe you do one off payments. But, but I do think ultimately the vision is, I think the telecommunications marketplace is going to change. And I think it's being forced, especially as we go to 5G. And then really when we go to 6G, it's gotta be transparent to the user, otherwise it will never work. Okay. Let's look at our, a few of our questions from our very engaged um, audience today. Um, Mark um, asks, can you give, can, no, how can we give the ITU more intergovernmental power? The magic idea for that? I'm not quite sure what that means. So the ITU is a treaty-based organization, um, but the majority of the treaty-based meaning, what I'd say are more meaningful areas are really radio communication. Um, so um, so I, I think the question is, it, it has a lot of power and it has the power that that the sovereign governments do. And because of political pressure, we don't have any enforcement in the ITU, but political pressure has always worked. Um, and, and it's a miracle. And, and I, I think at the end of the day, it's because otherwise people are gonna suffer interference. I, I don't see governments, I wish I could say that governments will give up more sovereign rights. I don't think they will. Um, so I think that's an issue. And we've seen that even in the EU is a good example where there's only been one pan-European licenses, type of licenses given 
governments don't like to give up those rights. So I, I don't know that we'd ever be successful as much as I'd like to say. It would be great if there was. I, I do want to say that the ITU has the Radio Regulations Board, and, and that's kind of their enforcement arm. And that's where if there are disputes between countries that can't be resolved, they go there. And while not 100% effective, I, I do think governments care if they're called out in public. So, so not ideal, but, but it's something. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Then uh, Chris comes back with an, a wonderful question uh, regarding communication. NPT, I'm not sure what that is, Internet Beyond our Orbit, Cis Lunar Space, Moon Deep Space. How do you think we should apply these lessons learned from ITU if relevant? That's a great question because I've been struggling with when you're starting to talk about building a 5G network on the moon, who regulates it? Um, so the ITU clearly does not have jurisdiction over that today. And when you get to deep space, you know, once again, so I, I do think this is something that the governments have to start coming together on, um, just like I think space sustainability really needs to be looked at um, from a global basis. Um, so, I, but I think in terms of lessons, I, I think it's the recognition, and, and I do think this is critical that no one own, no one owns the spectrum resource, whether that's on the on the Earth or in space or in deep space. That's an important part, but that was part of the Outer Space Treaty of 1964. Um, but the IT was built on that, and I think whatever regime is built here has to be the same. And I do think you have to start getting. This, the space bearing, um, space bearing nations together and start to say, well, what are we going to do? Because part of, you remember there was, we don't want to wait for a Titanic type experience, which is really what led to the ITU in part, um, we, or the, and the King of Prussia, but we don't want to wait to a, a catastrophic experience to have to do something. So, so I, I think that's one lesson that people should learn from is, we, we don't want to wait. We should be doing this now. And, and I, I really do urge governments to start thinking about this. But on that note, um, is there any progress in the ITU towards the deep space communication? Because I know from, from my experience with was one of the projects I've been involved and we want to put in, it was a 4G network on the moon. Um, which is now deployed by, by Nokia, um, that there was no regulation That's right. at all. And it was then not even, I think, in the WRC 27 plan. So that means we have Wild West. So companies go, plant their, their antennas, and then off we go. Yeah, there, there's nothing going on at the IT right now. As you said, there's nothing on the 27 agenda, which is still a draft agenda. There's nothing on that agenda. Maybe that will change. You know, I think the one thing that may change it is the movement towards looking at terahertz spectrum for use on Earth. Traditionally, that's been used for things like, you know, deep space exploration and so forth. So that may force this a little bit as, as, few, as other bands get looked at. But so far, I have not, we haven't really started our future agenda item planning for the 20 set for the 30 conference yet that'll happen in the next year so i say stay tuned i would be surprised if someone didn't bring it up but there's also a view by a number of people you know is the it the right body for it um you know do we really want it regulated you'll see you know right now optical is very in vogue right for things like inter-satellite links but the i2 doesn't have jurisdiction over optical much less quantum so, so I think these are issues that governments are going to have to grapple with. Do should you know if optical becomes really highly used, it becomes a scarce resource. It, it's it's not endless. Um, you know, quantum maybe put that aside, but but at some point, how do you start to handle this? And I, I feel like the governments, personally, I don't believe the governments have have done a good enough job with starting to think through these very tough issues. I see. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I do had um, uh, Alex, Alexandre Vallée uh, in one of my space cafes, I think a year or two years ago, and we talked about laser and, and, uh, and so on, and they have it on their radar. And uh, 
I think they will grab it at at this time when there is regulate regulation necessary. But we will see. It's as you, I think, greatly explained that it's not a fast moving entity at all. Well, and it would have to be a treaty change because it's li limited to the radio communication spectrum. So it would have to be done at a plenipotentiary, and that only happens every four years. You know, there's talk. Should the ITU be responsible for space sustainability? I have my questions about that, but if you did do it, not only would you have to do a treaty change, but you'd have to get the experts. You'd have to have people who understand it at the IT. You'd have to create, in my view, a new agency, a new bureau, but also you'd have to get the right people attending. Those are not the same people who go to the IT meetings. And I would say the same probably with optical. It's a very different cast of experts. And so anything you do really requires the political will if you're going to do it correctly. To do it poorly would be, I think, a mistake. I'd almost prefer it not regulated by an, an entity that couldn't do something that was meaningful. Okay. Thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, um, for, for your thoughts and guiding us through this yeah, very complex jungle, and that's what it is, and what what it will remain for quite some time. And sorry, Niklas, uh, we didn't come to your questions because uh, I I don't think they have been relevant for this conversation. So handing over or handing back to Kiara, did you learn Thank something today? A lot. Thank you so much. Good. I've been taking notes. It's very fitting that I'm sitting in a classroom right now. So <laughs> thanks so much for that. Um, yes, before we close off for today, I would just love to give a rundown of our next upcoming events. So actually, this Friday, we will have our next Space Cafe Scotland by the wonderful Angela Matisse. So please join for that. That's at 4 p.m. CST. Then on the 21st of June, we'll have our next 33 minutes with Dr. Deganit Pakowski. And then on the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th, you can find Torsten, Frank, Andreas, and me live at the ELA Air Show in Berlin, where we will be hosting two Space Cafe Germanys and a Space Cafe Young Global Talents live on stage. And then on the 28th of June, we will be talking with Graham Turnock. So as always, all events are going to be online on Eventbrite. And we love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up for our daily or our bi-weekly newsletters. And if you want to treat yourselves to something special, become a Space Watcher today or help us out in our supporter program. Again, huge thank you to Jennifer for this inspiring talk and for, for teaching us so much. Really, it's greatly appreciated. And thanks also to the entire team behind the scenes for doing this great job week in and week out. I hope that you all stay safe and stay healthy. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for asking all your questions. It's really great to see. I hope to see you all on Friday and in the next weeks. And in the meantime, visit our website, follow us on social media, and don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.